Well, 2017 is over. It's official. 2018 is here. So what are we going to do about it? What I want to talk about this morning, I want us to use today to reflect briefly, individually, and somewhat congregationally on the past, and then look ahead to the new year. And so this is going to be a time of soul-searching, looking deep within us, being honest. It doesn't do any good if we're not honest, does it? Being honest about things. Since 2017 has now gone, we can look back upon it and evaluate, evaluate how we have matured, how we've progressed. Certainly we don't want to ever plateau where we just stay. We always want, regardless of, uh, of who we are, regardless of our age, regardless of how long we've been in the Lord's church or whatever, we want to continue to grow, to progress. Well, to do that, we have to be honest about ourselves and we have to sincerely look at how things have gone and, and where I am today compared to 365 days ago. The first question, and certainly one of the most important is are you closer to God today than you were a year ago? Now that's a very basic question. Uh, you know, the writer James said in James chapter 4, verse 8, the very first part of it, draw near to God and He'll draw near to you. So are you closer? See, there, there is something that we can do personally to draw closer to God. That's what James is talking about. And he says, draw near to God. So there is personal responsibility there. There, there is diligence there. There's effort there. <coughs> Has your relationship with Him improved? You know, we looked 12 months ago. And we look at our relationship with God then and how close we were to God then. Are we closer to Him now? You know, that's a very, very vital question to ask. And it's a question that each of us has to have to answer individually. You know, I don't look at my brother or sister or someone and, well, I wonder if they're closer to God. I need to ask, am I closer to God? And is my relationship improved? There's an example of this way back in 2 Chronicles chapter 15, and I want to read verse 2. It's a, it's a great example of what I am talking about. 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 2. It says this, <clears throat> And he went out to meet... Asa, and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Now those are some pretty pointed questions, aren't they? You know, if, if you're going to seek him, he will allow you to find him. If you draw closer to Him, He'll draw closer to you. That's what He wants us to do. Well, how do I do that? Well, ask yourself, how often do you speak to Him? You know, you're not going to draw closer to someone unless you talk with them. Now, that's true in our, our personal relationships, relationship with friends or, or family or whatever. If you don't talk with them regularly, you're not going to get any closer to them. Well, that's true with God as well. So how often do you speak with God? You know, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 tells us that we're to pray regularly. The New King James says, pray without ceasing. Pray regularly. Pray habitually. Because you want to draw nearer to God. And so you must speak to Him more often. The second question from the past, have you been listening to Him through His Word? 
Have you been listening to Him through His Word? Because that's how He speaks to us today. In our Bible class this morning, we talked briefly about Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It's a very uh, well-known verse. I want us to read it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 talks about the Word of God and its importance and its power. You know, this, this book we hold in our hands is powerful. Verse 12 of the fourth chapter of Hebrews says, For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. See, it's speaking to us. It is the Word of God. Now, there's lots of important books out there. Nathaniel has an important book. It's a physics textbook. It's an important book. Parker has an important book. It's a chemistry textbook. And while those are important, this book is more important. Why? Because it comes from God, who its author is. See, this book is living and it's powerful. And it's so sharp that it can look within the tiniest divisions within us. That's how powerful it is. So have we been listening to Him more now than we did a year ago? Are we progressing? 1 Peter 2.2 2 instructs us to desire the pure milk of the Word. See, we've got to desire it. You're not going to read this book if you don't desire it. I'll go back to Parker and Nathaniel again. They've got to desire to learn physics, so they've got to desire to learn chemistry. Otherwise, they're probably not going to read it. Well, we've got to desire this book if we're going to read it like we need to read it. The Bible says to be diligent. Be diligent. We want to appear approved before God. How do we do that? By rightly dividing the word of truth, Paul tells Timothy. That means we have to apply ourselves and, and, and cut through it accurately. Cut a straight line. That's how I come to understand it. So it's important. We're to receive with meekness the implanted word. James chapter 1, verse 21. Receive it with meekness. We can do that. One of the reasons we must do that is because of what Peter says. 1 Peter 3.15 Be ready always to give an answer to those who ask you of the reason of the hope that's within you. So when people ask us, why do you believe in God? Or why do you believe that Jesus died on the cross? Or why do you believe that He was resurrected? Or why do you believe in the Bible? Why do you believe you should worship? And why do you believe this? Why do you believe that? Without studying the Word, we simply won't be able to give an answer to them. And they deserve an answer. They deserve an answer from us. So we need, we need to be able to give them an answer. So when we look back a year ago, are we more prepared to give an answer than we were a year ago? It's a very legitimate, very important question. Question three. How often this past year did we show that we love the brethren? The Bible says we need to show that. In 1 John chapter 5, I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love. So how many times did you show that you love the brethren? No, we can't do everything for everybody. That's impossible. But collectively, 
We want to be able to do that. Yeah, one person can't do it. Two people can't do it. Probably three or four people can't do that. But if everybody does something, then we can show that love for the brethren. That's what he wants us to do. And it's more than a feeling, it's more than an attitude. So often in the world we think about love being a feeling or an attitude. Biblical love goes way beyond that. Biblical love includes action. Yes, there's, there's feelings and attitudes, but it's the action part of love that the Bible stresses. Staying in 1 John, going back one chapter, 1 John chapter 3, notice what he says in verses 17 and 18. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. See, it's more than talking. It's more than a feeling. It's more than an emotion. It's showing it. See, it's showing it. Showing your love. That's what he wants. Our love for the brother needs to continually increase. Remember when Paul wrote to the, the uh, church in Thessalonica. He said, that's, that's what I've been hearing, is that your love continues to increase, to abound. Well, that's what he wants from us. So we look a year ago, and is our love increasing? Are we showing more acts of love toward the brethren? So it's an honest review of the year. You know, we have uh, all kinds of organizations. Most organizations have some sort of, you know, report about the state of the organization. We have the state of the union for our country, but all kinds of companies and organizations and so forth have reports about how well did the year go. Well, that's what we need to do individually. How well did the year go? And then, what have you done this past year to spread the gospel? Oh, that's an important one. What have you done to spread the gospel? And the gospel, gospel can be spread in so many ways. This is what Jesus is talking about in His Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5. We'll begin reading in verse 13. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. He says, You, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. See, salt has a purpose, doesn't it? But it can get to the point where it's no longer effective. And he says, what happens then? Well, you throw it out because its purpose is gone. It, it can no longer fulfill its purpose. So it says, you're the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor that they light a lamp and put it under a basket. Why? Because that's silly. That's why it's silly. Why would you do that? Why would you light something to illuminate it and then cover it up? Well, you wouldn't. But on a lampstand, put it high so people can see it. And it gives light to all who are in the house. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And here's the purpose. And glorify your Father in heaven. See, we have a responsibility to the lost. A responsibility. We need to spread that light wherever we go. Paul talks about this in his second letter that we have recorded to the church at Corinth. He says, we're to be like we have a fragrant aroma. That wherever we go, we spread it. We spread it. He said, to some people, it's going to be aroma of life. Other people will kind of reject that and it'll be aroma of death. 
But he says that's how Christians are to be. We're to spread that. Spread the knowledge of Christ. See, we need to do that wherever we go. So have we been inviting people to church or handing out DVDs or telling people about our relationship with Christ? I don't know about you, but I know I'm a year closer to judgment today than I was a year ago. I'm a year closer, which means I have a year less time. I have a year less time. So what about the future? What do I need to plan for this year? If we're going to let our light shine and we're going to be the kind of of people that's going to be effective, then I need to do my best to put away sinful practices, even questionable ones. You know, Christians don't even need to be involved in questionable ones. That's what the world does. Jesus told the woman, remember the woman that was taken in adultery in John chapter 8? What did he tell her? <clears throat> Go and sin no more. Very simple, very basic, very direct, honest. Just go and sin no more. Stop. That's what he said. Stop. Of course, that putting away starts on the inside. Jesus said, remember the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, I think it is. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Starts on the inside. Starts on the inside. So we need to abstain from every form of evil. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul told the church there that very thing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he tells them in verse 21, Test all things. Okay? Test everything. You know, we're exposed to so much today because of all the access we have to things. He says, test everything, hold fast what's good. Some of what you're going to test will be good, some will be bad. When you find something good, hold on to it. And then verse 22, abstain from every form of evil, from every kind of evil. And there's lots of kinds and forms of evil. So he says, abstain from all of them. We need to have that as a goal this year, to strive for it. Number two, be a better example to those around you. In 1 Timothy, a few pages over from where we just read, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, Paul tells Timothy something he needs to do that's critical, that's so important. Verse 12 of the fourth chapter says, Let no one despise your youth. But be an example to the believers in word, conduct, love, spirit, faith, impurity. Be an example. I was just talking with one of the teachers at school this week about how honesty had just been kind of thrown out the window in public education. So many students don't think anything about being honest. It's like it's an epidemic. And that's sad. And that's just uh, indicative of our culture and our society. Because our young people see older people, whether it's sports figures or, or, or uh, entertainment people or whoever, and, and how dishonest they are in their lives. So they assume that's okay. It's not. So Paul tells Timothy here, and Timothy was much younger than Paul at the time, says, be an example. Be an example. Word, conduct, love, faith, purity, all of that. Be an example. Be people of integrity. It doesn't matter if the rest of the world's not honest or the rest of the world are not people of integrity. We need to be. You know, as Christians, we need to show the world what, what it's like to be honest and people of integrity. We need to persevere this year. 
we do live in troubled times. And it's easy to give up. It's easy to give up. But we need to persevere. Don't quit. Don't give up. Philippians chapter 3. This is something Paul told the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter 3, he says, Not that I've already attained, or I'm already perfected, but I press on. See? He's not going to give up. He says, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Someone that runs, especially long distances, what are they told to, to not do? Don't look behind. Don't look behind. Keep your eyes ahead of you. Look toward the goal. That's what Paul says he's doing. He says, I can't look behind. I have to forget about everything that's behind me and go forward. So persevering. Don't grow weary while doing good. Paul told the churches of Galatians, Galatians 6, 9. Don't, don't grow weary. Don't grow tired of doing what's right. He finishes that sentence by says, you'll reap if you don't faint. See, if you don't give up, there is a finish line. And then here's one that's big. Stop wasting time. It's what Paul told the church at Ephesus. He told them, you've been wasting time. You need to stop it. Ephesians chapter 5 Verses 15 and following. This is what Paul tells the church at Ephesus. Verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, carefully, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And in some translations it actually comes out and says, stop wasting time. I and mean, that's basically what he's telling them says you are wasting time, so stop it and start using it better. You know, our time here on earth is very limited and once it's gone, it can't be recovered. Some things we can get back. Time isn't one of them. Time only goes one way. And then it's gone. Circumspectly. The idea is that you're, you're walking next to a uh, a, a, a severe drop off and to keep from falling dropping off what do you have to do watch carefully that's the idea of circumspectly you're very carefully watching where you're going watching what you're doing with your time have you ever been just kind of I won't use the term goofing off but I don't know what else to call it and then you look at the clock, wow, I just wasted two hours. What was I doing? See, that's the kind of thing he's talking about here. Now, he's not talking about resting because everybody needs to rest. But he says, watch carefully how you're spending your time. Make the most of every opportunity. And lastly, try kindness this year. In Ephesians chapter 4, the very last verse of that chapter, he says, be kind to one another. Be kind to one another. You know, many people in our world are harsh, critical, selfish, unfriendly, cold, rude. But that doesn't mean we have to be. We live by a higher standard. We do. And again, if we're going to let our light shine and we're going to be salt, make the world better, then we can't live like they are. Anyone, young or old, doesn't make any difference about their age, can show concern for others. You know, that's what James said in James 1.27. Pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this. 
To do what? Visit the fatherless and widows in their afflictions. Now visit isn't just go to see them necessarily. It's to do what you can for other people. Do what you can for other people. Help, assist, aid. So instead of expecting people to do things for you, you need to do things for other people. These are times where we have to really look deep inside. Honestly, sincerely, truly. So we need to let this year be a year of new beginnings. We had some wonderful things happen last year. One of those was our Vacation Bible School. Wonderful Vacation Bible School that's had great, great effects. We want to build on that, have another one this year, and, and, and hopefully have great effects from it, but other things as well. But individually, we need to look at ourselves and look at what where we were a year ago and where we are now. Where do you want to be a year from now? And make those adjustments. Make those plans. One step at a time, one day at a time. Draw closer to God every day. And of course that means, first of all, being a child of God, having our sins washed away in baptism. That's how we start to draw nearer to God. And we stay nearer to God by continuing to confess our wrongs. Being honest and sincere, knowing that we do wrong, that we do fail. Asking God to forgive us. Hopefully these things have made us think about this year and, and where we need to head and what we need to do personally and as a congregation. And this morning, if there's a, a need in your heart that you need to respond to that invitation for whatever reason, we want you to do that as we stand and sing.